On Tuesday night, we think it will all be over. Americans will cast a vote not just for the man who will sit in the Oval Office, but also in 51 other elections across the United States, 50 states plus Washington, D.C. Here now to give us a primer on what exactly happens on U.S. election night, David Jacobson, the U.S. Ambassador to Canada, and we're very happy to have you back here at TVO, Ambassador. Steve, it's great to be here. Well, as we watch this campaign go, a lot of us are wondering, is this one election or is this 51 elections? Can you help us on that? Well, it is 51 elections. It's 50, certainly at the presidential level, it is 51 elections, winner take all. We had this thing called a constitutional convention in 1787, and this was part of the deal that they made. We have an electoral college. Each state gets as the number of electors that go toward the 535 that we have the number of members in the House of Representatives plus the number of members of the Senate. So everybody has at least three. Uh, California has 55. Whoever gets the most votes in that state wins and takes all the electors. We should bring this up now, actually. I was going to do this later, but can we bring that map up right now? These are the 2008 returns. You can see them on the monitor over my shoulder here. The blue states, obviously, are the ones that Barack Obama won. The red states are the ones that John McCain won. And yes, go to the left. There's 55 electoral votes for California. Texas is second at 34. Go up to the northeast, you see New York with 31. And the deal is, you win 51% of the votes, you get 100% of the points. Is that the way it works? 50.1. You get 50 one, one, right. one vote more than half, and you get all the electors. Um, you know, the, to, to understand this, if Mitt Romney were to win, let's say, Alabama by 300,000 votes, and Barack Obama wins Ohio by 500 votes, all you got to do is ask Al Gore who wins the election. <laughs> Uh, and that's the way right. it works. It is right. the system we live with. It is the system we've lived with for 230-odd years. Uh, it is a controversial system in my country, uh, but it's the name of the game. I gather the founders didn't entirely trust the people to pick the president directly, and that's why they had the people vote for electors. So you have an electoral college that actually picks the president as opposed to the people. What, that is correct. Uh, that is, uh, these days, this, there, there's this concept of faithless elector, someone who is picked, let's say your state went for Governor Romney, uh, and the, the 15 votes are supposed to go to Governor Romney. In some states, they are pledged legally, and in some states, they're not. But as a practical matter, it, that has never made a difference. But you're right. Uh, the guys who made this decision back in 1787 uh, did have some concern for runaway populism, and that was part of the reason, anyway, for the Electoral College. Another part of it was a compromise. Why haven't you got rid of this system? I know in Richard Nixon's time they almost did. But, what, I mean, truthfully, it does seem like a bit of an anachronism nowadays, doesn't it? Well, part of it is one side or the other always seems to think that it advantages them. The other reason is that small states, if you're from, uh, for example, uh, North Dakota, which has one congressman, uh, they have three electoral votes. So they get more than their proportionate share. On the other hand, if you live in New York, you live in California, you live in Illinois, where I live, your vote, at least for the president, does not matter nearly as much as somebody who lives in Ohio. So there's okay. a problem. I've got to follow up again on this then, because this is a terrific irony. California's got 38 million people. Texas has got 25 million people. The candidates, I don't think, maybe for some fundraising trips, but they basically never go there. That's correct. They spend their time in places like Colorado, population 5 million, Iowa, population 3 million, because New Hampshire. New Hampshire, population, I don't know what, a million not, and a half? Not much. Yeah, because these places are in play, and they campaign the heck out of these places. Again, tell me why that makes sense. Well, you know, I, I, I am not going to sit here and justify the Electoral <laughs> College. Like I said, it's the, you know, it's the rules of the game. The rules of the game are get 270 electors. Uh, you know, if you had asked me back in 2000 when Al Gore carried the popular vote and lost the Electoral College, I wasn't so happy. Uh, you know, if it were to go the other way, I'm sure some of my friends across the aisle wouldn't be so happy. Um, it is the system we live with. It, it, there's just no question about it. Uh, people have said that uh, Governor Romney and President Obama are not running to be President of the United States. They're running to be President of Ohio. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of what's going on. There's a certain amount of truth to that, though, isn't there? It is. It is. There are, there are, at the moment, there are about, there are, by most people's count, seven states that are still in play. 
Uh, and that's where all the effort is being focused, all of it, all of the money. If you look at where the advertising is being spent, the, the lion's share of it is being spent in those states. Let's uh, bring up, if I can now, on page two. These are the 2008 presidential election results. You need 270 electoral college votes to win, and that's what happened last time. Barack Obama got 365 electoral college votes, and he got that on the basis of actually 53 percent of the total votes cast, which is not a huge landslide. John actually, McCain. His, by historic by his, levels, it true. is a landslide. It that's was true. the biggest spread, I believe, since Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, which is, and, but seven points is not yeah. all that much. But here's the thing. It's not going to be a seven-point election this time, obviously. It's so neck and neck, it's not funny right now. What if you need 270 to win? What if it's 269 to 269? What happens then? Well, first of all, it has never happened. But what would happen, bizarrely, is that it would go to the House of Representatives. After the electors cast their votes, and everybody votes, and they're all done, and it's 269, 269. Uh, the House of Representatives, with one vote per state, decides who's going to be the president. And then they go across the aisle and they go to the Senate. And the Senate votes for the vice president. Uh, it has never happened, uh, you know, given the makeup of the House of Representatives, where there are a lot of smaller, more rural states uh, that tend to be more Republican. There are a lot more Republican states than there are Democratic states. You know, everyone kind of assumes that uh, it would go in that direction, but that would be a very difficult situation. But let's play this through. If it's 269 to 269, the House picks the president, that means Romney. The Senate picks the vice president, which the Democrats, if they hang on to, means Joe Biden. I'll give you an even better situation. It's 269, 269, and the Senate after this election is 50-50. But Biden is still the vice president of the United States, and so he breaks he the breaks tie. He breaks the tie and votes for himself. Mm -hmm. But how do you run a country? I mean, your country, it's tough enough to run your country when the two members on the ticket are from the same party. How could you have a president and a vice president on different tickets? Uh, Steve, as I say, it's never happened. The odds of that happening are, are extremely <laughs> slim. I think uh, I'm going to go out and buy lottery tickets because it's more likely I'll cash one of those in. But the House has picked the president before in your history. That has happened a couple of times. Uh, it has when no one has had a majority, but it, it, it is it, the likelihood that, that we're going to get 269, 269. Uh, I, uh, Nate Silver, who is the guru yeah. of all numbers, I think he puts the chances of that at like 0.01%. This so, would be the year when it happens, though. Uh, and, and I'm not sure my heart could take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's focus on you for a little bit here. Uh, you are, okay, it's no secret here, you were a big supporter of Barack Obama's in the last election. You worked for him, you're friends with him, and as a result, you're the American ambassador to Canada. What are you allowed to do in this campaign? I'm allowed to watch TV. I'm allowed to read the newspapers. You know, I, I, I am a little bit like the fire horse and the old fire horse and the bell goes off and he's still in the barn and he wants to get out and run, but he can't. Uh, it is a little on the frustrating side. I, I've been involved in the last several presidential elections. I am not in any way involved in this one. Uh, one of the things about my job is that I am the ambassador for all the American people. I am the ambassador for Republicans. I'm the ambassador for Democrats. I'm the ambassador for independents. And I take that responsibility very seriously. So I am not here as a partisan. You know, I think probably everybody who's watching your show knows who I support. Um, but that's not my job. Uh, and so I'm really on the sidelines on this one. I'm watching just like you're watching. You have not participated in any of the campaign calls or called in or uh, nothing, nothing? Nothing. You haven't spoken to the president, given advice to David Axelrod, I nothing? Have, I have spoken to the president, but not about the campaign. Really? Or, and David Axelrod, you don't? No, no. I, really? I sometimes talk to my friends because they're involved. I haven't talked to Ax, but talk to others uh, who are my friends who are still involved. Uh, just, you know, hey, how's it going, and gee, are you having fun? But I don't talk about the politics. I don't involve myself in the politics. That would be inappropriate. You give speeches in this country all the time. All the time. But you don't plug for Obama? I, I have tried very, very hard not to. And, and again, uh, sometimes it, it, it strains my, my abilities to be fair, but that's my goal. Is it killing you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, 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 my heart isn't what it used to be. Uh, no, it's, you know what, 
I have the best job in the United States government. And, uh, you know, this is one little bit of bad that comes with a whole lot of good. This has just been an extraordinary experience. Uh, I'm in a wonderful country, the probably strongest relationship between two countries on earth, and uh, I would not trade it for a minute. Is there protocol of what an ambassador does after Tuesday night? Um, I serve and have served since the day I got here at the pleasure of the president. What that means is I am not here for any fixed term. Uh, I am here for as long as whoever sits in that chair as President of the United States wants me to be here. President Obama could call me this evening and say, hey, I'm sorry, I watched you on Steve Pakin's show and I want you out of here. I hope he won't, but uh, he could. I think that'd be cool because uh, that means he's watching. Well, that he, would be neat. He, he, no doubt he is. Mm -hmm. I, um, but, but I serve at the pleasure of the president. I am quite confident that uh, it would be the pleasure, I, I would give more pleasure to an Obama administration than I would to a Romney administration. Uh, but the fact is that I serve at the pleasure of the president and whoever's there can decide whether they want me here or don't want me here. I, I, as I say, I love it here and I want to stay as long as I can. Now, I, I think when, I think I've got this right. I think when Richard Nixon was president, when he won his second term in 1972, as a matter of course, I think all the ambassadors were requested to resign so that he had the flexibility to keep who he wanted and get rid of who he wanted. Is that practice in place today? Actually, I don't know the, the specific answer to that, but as a practical matter, anyone the president wants to submit any time and for anyone who serves at his pleasure that he asks for a letter of resignation, he'll get it. Okay. Uh, George W. Bush. When he won his second term, he went a different way. He picked a second, you know, he had um, Paul Salucci first, and then he went for David Wilkins mm -hmm. in the second term. Uh, so will you be surprised if, if assuming President Obama is reelected, if he decides to go with somebody else for a second term? A actually, uh, Steve, no, I won't. Uh, the, the norm here is, and, and I won't say there's never been an exception, I'm sure somewhere with hundreds of ambassadors and many administrations there have been, but generally the norm is that someone serves for a term, if, the sa if someone of the same party or the same president is reelected, uh, sometimes an ambassador will serve for a period longer than that, uh, but usually not for an extended period beyond that. Uh, you know, I'm sure that there are plenty of other folks that uh, will do a good job here. And, uh, you know, as I say, I like every day I'm here. Uh, but I would expect that the president would have somebody else in mind at some point. And again, I don't know how this works, but do they call you and ask you? And do uh, they say, do you want to stay? Well, or? they haven't yet, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> he hasn't won yet. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay, let's come full circle. Who you get your money on next Tuesday night? Well, okay, I am not, th this is not as a partisan matter. Um, it is going, the popular vote is going to be very, very close. You know, you pay your money, you take your choice among the polls. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the president probably has a little bit better map when you go back to that, that Let's map bring it up of if electoral we can, votes. Let's uh, bring that back up. From, uh, admittedly, these would be the 2008 results. Yeah. But show us but, how you think that map might look different well, Tuesday night. Well, you're, you're probably going to see Colorado is very close, very, very close. Florida uh, is very close. Virginia, these, these are states that the president won. Uh, North Carolina that he won last time. I think, uh, I, I think the bottom line, Steve, without going through state by state, the bottom line is the president probably starts with about 250 votes in his pocket and Governor Romney has in the low 200s. Um, and so Governor Romney has to do better among all these close battleground races than the president does. Based on that fact and that fact alone, I would say that the president has a little bit of an edge. But having said that he has an edge does not mean that he will win. Uh, you know, someone was talking about this the other day and if you are ahead by two points in a football game with five minutes to go, you have a 65% chance of winning. I was going to say, that's nothing. That, well, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and I, having watched an awful lot of football games where my team was ahead by two points, I didn't leave and go to the store. I stayed there and watched till the end. Uh, and I think that's what we're going to have to do this time. And you joked earlier about they both want to be the president of Ohio, but it, does it... I guess in 2004, it really did come down to Ohio. George W. Bush won Ohio, and therefore, 
beat John Kerry. If 65,000 votes had flipped in Ohio, John Kerry would have been the President of the United States. So when people watch this thing on election night, forget all the noise. Watch Ohio, is that what you're saying? Well, it, there, each of the candidates has a path to victory without Ohio, but it's tough. It is particularly tough for Governor Romney, but it is tough for either one of them without Ohio. Uh, I think we're going to be watching late into the night. I would not recommend that you make any early appointments on Wednesday. Uh, this could go on for a while. They could be counting votes for a while. Uh, one of the things that I, I think is important to watch is not just who wins some of the states where they close early, like Virginia, which is the first one to close at 7 o'clock Eastern. It's not just who wins, but how quickly they win. If somebody gets Virginia called in their favor five minutes after the polls close, something may be going on. If Florida, which everyone thinks will probably go for Governor Romney, goes for Governor Romney, but it goes immediately, something may be going on. On the other hand, if it drags on and on and on, maybe it's more complex. So it's not merely who wins those early states, but how quickly the numbers come in. We know there, there has been, in some elections in Canada, a tradition where literally on the last weekend before the vote, they're like dominoes, right? Like people just, the undecideds decide to go almost en masse one place over another. And close elections suddenly aren't so close mm -hmm. a few days later. Does that happen in American presidential elections as well? Well, you know, historically something like that has happened in the past. The difference this time is there do not appear to be a whole lot of undecided voters. Mm -hmm. You're fighting over a very, very narrow sliver of folks. You know, as someone who follows this the way you do, it, it's almost hard for me to believe that someone could have been watching this for years and still go, gee, I, I just don't know what to do. <laughs> Who could be on the side uh, at this stage? Huh? And, and, and so there aren't very many of those folks. And, and so the likelihood that there's going to be a huge shift and that this is not going to be a close election is not very great. Uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with just a couple of folks. The, on the other hand, the one thing that does happen, and this is particularly true in House and Senate races, but it would be true in the electoral college races at the presidential level. Close races tend to all fall the same way. If you get, went back to your map of 2008 and uh, the president getting 365 electoral votes, trust me, when we went into election day, you know, there were an awful lot of those close states and they all but one fell to the president's way. And so, as is the case in Canada, close races tend to fall in the same direction. So a national mood, if you like, does actually take over there, in some there, respects. It, well, it, it, clearly there are, there are local issues, there mm -hmm. are issues state by state, but yes, there is something uh, that move, things tend to move in the same direction. In our last couple of minutes here, I want to ask you about one more thing, and that is weather. Weather on Election Day is usually a big deal, mm -hmm. but it's really a big deal this time in a lot of places. Do you have any sense about how that plays out for one candidate versus the other? Well, there, I think there's weather is important here for two reasons. One, the, the tragedy of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and I think that the way that the president handled it, the fact that Americans do tend to, to uh, uh, coalesce behind their leader in difficult circumstances is a factor here. Uh, you know, we'll have to wait to see how it plays out. Are things going well? But, but it, it is clearly a factor. I think how Governor Romney responds to that is also going to be a factor. So that's one piece of the weather. The other is the weather actually on Election Day. And, you know, good weather is Democratic weather and bad weather tends to be Republican weather. That Democrats want a high turnout. They always want a high turnout. Their voters tend to be people who don't vote with the same frequency. Now, we're talking about very small margins, but, but they tend not to be people who vote with the same frequency as Republicans. Uh, and so good weather, Democratic weather, rain, good for the Republicans. So if it's raining in Ohio, watch out. Watch out. <laughs> you want to make a prediction? Uh, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll stick to it's going to be real close and don't make any appointments for Wednesday morning. I think you're probably right about that one. Uh, Ambassador Jacobson, we always appreciate your visits here to TVO. Thanks so much. Steve, it's always good to be here. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.